React has quickly become the most popular framework on the web. There's no disputing its dominance there. While other frameworks from the past, present, and future are all doing pretty well, React is the default. But what if I told you the web isn't actually what React was built for? In fact, the React package that you install to start your projects has no web code in it at all. What the hell am I talking about? Let's dive in. It's important to understand as you get deeper into React that React itself isn't the thing that renders your application in the web. React is the virtual DOM layer, the hierarchy of components and state that tells something else what to render. The vast majority of the time somebody's using React, they're using it with a package called React DOM, which allows the virtual DOM that React manages to tell the real DOM what to render, when to render it, and when to change it when it needs to change. But React DOM is just one of many different packages that React can render to. And while React Native allows you to render to a lot of places like Android, iOS, different video game consoles, Windows, and Mac, I think you guys are going to enjoy a lot of these different use cases for React, especially the ones at the end. And while many have web theming within them, very few of them are actually focused on the web itself. So let's take a look at some of these fun places I've seen people use React that aren't the browser. Remotion is a super exciting project using React to make video. I haven't had a chance to play with this as much as I'm hoping to, and I might even make a video in the future all about Remotion. Let me know in the comments if that's an interesting idea for you. The value of Remotion is you can use reusable React components as elements in a video. So in this example, you can have an image that scales itself over time as part of your video. You can use the frame data, you can use their interpolation helpers. And now when you run the code for this project, it will generate a video that scales the image over time and it exports a real MP4. It's not like this is a thing that renders in your browser and then you've just like screen captured or some stuff. It's actually using FFmpeg and other tools under the hood to render render out an actual video file. React is just the method of defining and composing the elements within your video. They also now have like a paid license and a proper video editor. You can also just NPM init video and build really cool things using this technology today. It's surreal to use your knowledge as a React developer to build a video, but it works really well, especially for things like animations and movement behaviors within a video. I'm actually hoping to try this soon to add some nice animations and effects to some of my videos. So I'll be sure to report back once I do that. But this is just one of the many crazy examples of things people have used React for. Another one that I've been talking about recently is React email. This is a little closer to traditional React because it's still rendering HTML in the end. But the difference between real HTML and email HTML is, if you don't already know about it, I envy you. HTML for emails is miserable. It is really bad. And with React email, an abstraction has been made to simplify the annoying parts of email templating in HTML. And a bunch of components have been provided the same way you would use something like Material UI. Instead, you use their HTML component, their button component, all of these other things. And they even have a, a huge huge pile of examples where they remade common email UI using React email. So here's the famous Vercel invite user, super simple, join the team page. And here's the source code they used to make it. It's actually pretty readable as a React dev. You import all of their components because again, this isn't rendering HTML. You can't just use a div or a span. You use their components but their components all build the right HTML underneath. And this allows you to trivially write something that's way more readable, even using Tailwind, some amount of Tailwind. It, it's interesting how that all works. Regardless, this feels just like writing a React app, but now an actual email comes out <laughs> instead of the HTML chaos that we used to have to deal with. I have been blown away with React email and we are absolutely gonna be using it for pretty much every email we send going forward. And the people who made React email just started a company, Resend, that I was so hyped about, I actually invested in them. So I, yes, am biased because I'm invested, but I made the investment because I'm that hyped on what they're doing. And it's so cool seeing React developers using the strengths of React, the framework, not React, the rendering library to make hard problems easier to solve. I'm genuinely hyped for these guys. I love what they're doing. They have some cool stuff coming in the future. So what else do we have? This one, we will have some mixed feelings about, but I think it's a really, really important package. React PDF. Sometimes you just need a PDF and programmatically generating one, it's not the most fun thing. I personally spent a lot of time using LaTeX in college because it was fun making those fancy, overly margined, well-formatted, research-looking documents. But sometimes you just need to make an invoice or update some values inside of a document that can be saved and printed trivially. I would often find myself making an HTML page and printing that as a PDF in order to do work like this, but that doesn't use any of the native PDF features or interactions at all. React PDF is a solution to use React. And again, you import from their components and their rendering solution. 
But now you can create a PDF using React components. That's so powerful. You can make reusable pieces, structure them, and do the things you need to do as a document writer. And you could even use this to build like your own DIY alternative to something like LaTeX or even something like Adobe InDesign. I haven't played with this too much. I know my CTO has, and he has very mixed feelings. But at the same time, there's nothing as accessible in the web ecosystem as this for generating PDFs programmatically. I think this library is awesome. I'm really pumped that it exists. And it's cool to see developers using React for things that aren't just the DOM. React is good for all sorts of different interfaces, not just ones that you use on the web. One fun example of this is React for CLIs, specifically the package Ink. It lets you make React components as interactive elements for a CLI application. So obviously, yes, you have to run a CLI app with JavaScript, but you can use the knowledge and state management solutions you're used to in the React ecosystem to help manage the behaviors in your CLI. From my experience, this is a really good solution for simple CLI applications. Once you get into more complex behaviors and longer running things, it might not be the best solution, but it's so cool it exists and it makes it really easy for a React developer to start building a CLI tool quicker than you'd ever expect. One more similarly fun one where text input and output is the primary use case is Reaccord by Maple. I'll be sure that we put a link somewhere for this. The TLDR of this is it lets a React developer create elements inside of Discord for doing reactions to messages and such. It's a basic interface for creating reusable parts in a Discord bot. And if we look at the examples here, you can create a component like this uptime component and client.onready reaccord.send to this channel ID, this component. So damn cool. I, yeah, I've had to do crazy stuff to get messages working within Discord and having a consistent, reliable syntax that where I can use React to define this stuff is dope. If I already have a Next.js application, for example, where we're using React and we have to send a message to Discord on an action on our server, being able to define that as a component and just render it with Reaccord on our server and send that to Discord, that's so powerful. And I'm genuinely hyped to see more and more solutions like this cropping up because people recognize the strength of React as more than just a solution for the browser. We're going to dive now into my favorite corner, which is the Poimanders crew. Poimanders is well known for creating Zustand and Jodai, both of which I'm pronouncing incorrectly, as well as probably Poimanders, honestly. Paul Henschel and Daishi are two of the best React developers in in the world, let's be real. And they have both been pushing the possibilities of React for a long time. A big part of why both Zustand and Jodi were made was to make simple, modular, performant state solutions for updating things inside and outside of React. And a big part of the inspiration to build those came from a library that Paul Henschel and crew have been working on for a while, React 3 Fiber. If you're not already familiar with React 3 Fiber, it might be helpful to start with 3JS. The goal of 3JS was to make WebGL more accessible in JavaScript land by giving you direct access to the primitives, lighting, behaviors, and all the cool things you can do in WebGL. It's far from a game engine. It's very, very primitive by design, but what it allows is for full-on WebGL control from JavaScript land with decent primitives for things like animations, audio embedding, cameras and camera behaviors, shadows, lighting, a lot of the annoying primitives to implement. And 3GS has done a great job of implementing them, but if you're not already a 3D or game engineer, learning 3JS well enough to take advantage of all of these pieces can be, to be frank, a challenge. And once you get into reusing pieces, state management within a 3JS application and all of that, you're basically relearning how to program if you're not coming from this game dev world already. If you are, 3GS is phenomenal solution. But if you're coming from React and you want to play with 3D stuff like 3JS, it's really hard to beat React 3 Fiber. Instead of rendering to the DOM like React traditionally would, React 3 Fiber renders to 3JS, which renders to a WebGL canvas. So you're able to create 3D assets, elements, behaviors, lighting, whatever you need in React components, which I think is so cool. I have a whole video about 3JS already. I'll be sure to link that in the description. But the simple example here it has a box component, which is a reusable box element has a ref, it has state all in it, it has use frame, which is one of their custom hooks for doing updates without having to trigger React itself. And then it returns a mesh with all of these properties. And now if I click, it's gonna do the things that the use state says it should. And if we scroll down here, we see the actual app, which has a canvas, which is the parent element that renders all of this. And then all of these different elements, including two of this custom box component. And if I wanted more of these, I can just copy paste and I can put it somewhere else. We'll put it at like 2.4. It's gonna be even further to the side. Now we see that extra box over there. It's just React. I think this is the coolest shit ever. And if you're already a React developer, you probably can read this code and roughly understand what's going on, which is awesome. 
because now React is being used as a lens and as a framing for some other more complex thing, in this case, 3D rendering. The strength of something like React when it comes to building these solutions is that a developer who really well knows the platform being rendered to can take the best parts, build good primitives around them, and then expose those in React. So you don't have to deal with all the weird parts around it. You just use the component they provide and it does what it's supposed to. And that's exactly what we see inside of React 3 Fiverr and what the cool stuff people are doing with it. The funny example that I said I would save to the end here is another library by our friends at Poimanders called React Nil. Of the things we talked about today, this is going to be the least production ready. I don't think it's meant to be used in production at all. It hasn't been touched for over a year. This was mostly an experiment by Paul. Paul made this because he really enjoyed the power of React state management in terms of composable architecture. Having something like an effect or a memo that triggers when certain things occur is valuable outside of UI programming. And he wanted to see what it would look like using React's lifecycle to manage code on a server. So the goal here with React Nil was to give you a package that lets you render null in React so you can just use it as a backend. You can use it as a state management solution in an app that isn't React. You can use it as a server side solution for managing things like web sockets or just backend API calls. And it's pretty dang cool. I've never actually played with this. I just think it's a cool concept. But the idea of just not rendering anything at all in React so that you can still run the life cycles and run the code and use the React model that you may be familiar with without having a UI come out the other side at all. I want to emphasize, I don't think you should use this. I think it's a really cool demonstration of just how well abstracted React is from the rendering engine itself. And this is why something like React Native happened in the first place. This is a fun fact a lot of people don't know. The Twitter web app is written with React Native for web. In fact, the Twitter web app is the first ever use case of React Native for web because it was built for Twitter. The team leading the rewrite was concerned that giving the devs access to everything the browser could do, every element and every behavior, in order to prevent developers from using the parts they didn't think they should use in order to guarantee consistency across their web app and their solution, they built React Native for web to use React and React Native as the custom layer making sure only certain things could be rendered in certain ways. If the component wasn't provided through React Native and the React Native for web binding couldn't be used because the devs weren't using React DOM. They weren't just rendering DOM elements. They were using this abstraction that was custom made for Twitter's use case. And this solution eventually became React Native for web. I know that seems like three layers when previously it seemed like one. Reality is it was already two layers. It's just React DOM, the in-between of your DOM and React, gave you full access to everything in the DOM. And these other solutions like React Native for web pick a subset of what the DOM has to expose to you. I'm sure a handful of y'all already knew about this abstraction, but many don't. And I think it's important to understand that React DOM is not React. And there's a difference between these parts. That doesn't mean you shouldn't use React with React DOM most of the time. It just means that you should understand the difference there because it might help you appreciate the power of these other tools. On top of that, everything I showed today is pretty damn cool. And I think is worth playing with in your own time if you haven't already. So what do you think? Do you have the time to play with React 3 Fiber or React email yet? How does it feel using React outside of the DOM? I'm so curious curious about all the crazy things y'all have used React for, and I'd love to hear more about it. And maybe, just maybe, we're going to talk about React on PlayStation someday. Thank you guys, as always. If you want to hear all about React 3 Fiber specifically, I'll pin a video about that in the corner here. Really appreciate y'all, as always. Peace, nerds.